Welcome to Under the Volcano's first live event in English. We did a terrific event 10 days ago, all English. So we're getting there, poco a poco. I want to let you know that tonight's poets and I were all originally supposed to meet up tonight at Book Culture, a wonderful book on the Upper West Side in Manhattan, but that was BC before Corona. Things have overtaken us, and tonight we're all in quarantine, actually in three different places and three different time zones, San Francisco, Teposlan, Mexico, and Massachusetts. And we're pretty sure that if you're in our audience, you're also in quarantine wherever you are. So we're still trying to wrap our heads around what this all means, but one way that's become apparent as a way to transform our isolation is to reach out from these separate boxes. I think you're seeing us in little rectangles, if I'm not mistaken, on Zoom and Facebook. And to take this chance, this opportunity to invite more of you into our ongoing literary community ever could in Teposlan, which is under the volcano's terrestrial home. Many of you have been there, but I imagine many have not. Um, so more than resigning ourselves to use a technology that in so many ways seems almost ironically to mimic the idea of social distancing, we're choosing to use it our way and to emphasize the social rather than the distance. And I hope that this evening will not only be fascinating and entertaining, but perhaps offer yet another attempt to make that, uh, bring that to life, that whole idea. Would we rather all be together in one place, that bookstore on the Upper West Side, or here in Teposan, all together with us? Of course we would. But what we are gonna do tonight is our very best lean out of our separate boxes and move around a little bit and bring you into this community that's been converging in Teposlan since 2003. So before we jump into the actual reading and talk that we've planned for you tonight, I just want to go over, as we all must these days, the basic notion and shape of the evening. We'll be together for approximately one hour. Um, we're here because we're celebrating the launch of two beautiful new books of poetry, which I'll speak about in a moment. And I want to let you know that there's an override um, right now on all of your audio. So everyone has been muted by our terrific puppeteer, Juan Arevalo, who's also in quarantine in Cuernavaca, not far from here where I am. And the chat function should be visible on your screens as a sidebar on Facebook. So please feel free as we move along to make comments or um, send in questions that you may have. We will try, uh, assuming there's enough time left at the end, um, but we can't guarantee that, we hope, to leave some time for your questions to be handled and conveyed either to both of the readers or to one or the other. Um, I also want to say that if you don't yet know about Under the Volcano, if by some chance you've stumbled into this event just in the vast reaches of cyberspace, please treat yourself to an exploration of our website, which is underthevolcano.org, or we're a nonprofit organization and we have um, a pretty decent presence on social media. So please find us there, follow us there. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, of course, as you can see here, where this whole event will appear magically um, as soon as it ends in an archival video and your chat will also be preserved there. It's so cool, right? So, um, I should also say uh, where I am, it's about 80 degrees. It's very hot, a bit suffocating. And we're in the hinge between the dry season and the rainy season. Should it suddenly begin to rain as it has the last few nights and I lose internet, 
three other people in this event will jump in and impersonate me and have perfect um, instincts for how to pull it all together, I'm sure. But I hope to be here for the duration. So um, what I want to say about both of tonight's readers is um, they both have incredible new books out. Cyrus is maybe 10th or 8th, I believe, he'll tell you. And Christina's, I believe, first, um, she'll tell you, both with rather extraordinary titles. Uh, nothing easy here. We're going to be hearing from Cyrus more than Watchmen at Daybreak and from Christina's She Giant in the Land of Here We Go Again. Ambitious, interesting, provocative titles, and I'm going to let them describe in their own words exactly uh, what these books are. So, um, in fact, before we even do a formal statement of their bios, I wonder if I could just ask you each, uh, it's not generally done with poets, please don't be insulted, if you could give us like a 30 second elevator pitch about your book. Just what is it? You know, what manner of beast is your chapbook, Cyrus? It's a sequence of 12 poems that I created in isolation. I was given a hermitage by the Christ in the Desert Benedictine Monastery. And I wrote it while I was there with no internet or phone or anything. So out in the wilderness, I wrote this book. The whole thing? The whole thing, yeah. Fantastic. And Christina, what would you say if someone said, what is this she giant book? <laughs> well, it's a book that tries to uh, look back and connect a lot of dots. And uh, the book started with some experiences in Iceland where there was an uncanny resemblance of the physical landscape with the emotional terrain. And I soon realized that there were echoes and reverberations of all sorts of past traumas and you know events that were continuing through. So the book has takes place in a lot of different countries and a lot of different landscapes. Um, there's prophecy and omen, and it's really um, trying to think about the power that an individual has um, to both love and to destroy. That's it, huh? That's it, that's all. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> um, all right, you know, at some point in this conversation, we're gonna to wanna to know who the sea giant is, but I'm gonna leave that to you. What I'd like to do now is actually just read out the bios of both poets, and then we're going to um, engage in some little bit of conversation back and forth and mainly reading so that you in the audience get a chance to hear in their own voices, uh, what I've had the pleasure of experiencing these past few weeks on the page. So um, it's not by chance that Christina and Cyrus are linked in this event. They both have a deep connection to Under the Volcano. Um, Cyrus is a 2019 Guggenheim Fellow. He's won early in his career the National Poetry Series, a Lambda Literary Award, a Lennon Literary Award, and the William Carlos Williams Award. His uh, 2018 book of poems, The Gospel According to Wild Indigo, was a finalist for the NAACP M uh, Award, Still Life with Children, his selected poems of Frances Parcerisas just came out, translated from the Catalan, won the Texas Institute of Letters Sueret Deal Fraser Award for Best Translated Book. I guess I was off by one count with the number of books. His seventh and eighth books, The World That the Shooter Left Us, and Is There Room for Another Horse, uh, which is a finalist for the 2019 National Poetry Series, are forthcoming from four books. So the book from which he's largely going to be reading tonight is, in fact, his ninth. Cyrus is a professor of English at Texas State University and says that he's based in Austin, although I have to say he's one of the more nomadic people I've ever met. And, uh, <laughs> it, you know, a year in Cyrus's life means uh, a whole bunch many of places. Yes, many places. Many places. Continue. Cyrus Cassell's taught our poetry 
Ford class this past January in Teposlan, and he'll be returning in January for Under the Volcano 2021, whether in terrestrial form or as a spirit beamed into <laughs> cyberspace again from wherever. I can we see. <laughs> <laughs> Shazam! <laughs> so that people understand that Under the Volcano is going ahead and we will be uh, running our program and with a splendid faculty in 2021. So, and uh, applications opening up early June. Christina Beecher, or Christina Anderson Beecher, I should say with the two S's of Scandinavia, is a poet, essayist, and translator living in New York City when she's not not living in New York City. Her poems and translations have been published in Plowshares, Colorado Review, Brooklyn Rail, Harvard Review, Hayden's Ferry Review, Plume, Denver Quarterly, Painted Bride Quarterly, and others. Her full-length translation of Swedish poet Marie Lundquist's I Walk Around Gathering Up My Garden for the Night will be published later this year by Bitter Oleander Press. Christina has an MFA from Sarah Lawrence College. She's also a two-time alumna of Under the Volcano where she did poetry master classes with Francisco Segovia and Mark Doty. So if you were here and we could hear you clap, I would assume there would be a great round of applause as we launch into <clears throat> the core of this evening's event. Um, already given us a kind of crazy of your books before you actually each read a selection, what I thought I might ask you about, just building on the conversation that we started in January here in Mexico, because it was 2020, it doesn't seem like it still could be the same year, does it? But it is 2020, and we have a long way yet to go. And it is the year of perfect vision, although there were a couple of large things that we failed to notice coming at us. Um, so I feel like it's still really important, whatever is going on inside us as we struggle to keep going, keep writing, make some sense of what is going on. In general, I think it's always important for writers to think about what we see, how we see it, and maybe what even matters to see, because the world is very, very large. The cosmos is very large, so beautifully invoked by Cyrus at the end of his 12 poems, you'll hear that. And I know both of your books were long finished and on their way or at the printers when this pandemic struck us. But I still wonder if you might, looking back on these books before all of this colored perhaps or reading of everything, if you would say something about how your poems come to be, are they planned? Do you plan a book? Maybe some do, some don't. Some books get planned, some don't. Or are they serendipitous? Are the poems linked? Is there intentionality to the, to the whole? Is there a sense of sequence ahead of you? Or is the assembling of your books really a product of hindsight? Which is a kind of sight, right? Yeah. All right. That was just one question. It's about vision and how you Yeah. Do you want me to start, Micah? Sure. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think it's really the latter, what you said about hindsight. And I feel that, um, you know, in the case of this book, each poem arose from a different impulse, right? And so uh, they really were sort of independently coming up out of nowhere. Um, and then as I started to look at them and see what they all had in common, I realized there was this sense of treading the same ground again, you know, and I mentioned being in Iceland where two tectonic plates, you know, met, um, and also domestic plates met. Um, but also I realized I had a poem about Cuba, right? And I get rid of the title and Cuba was Iceland, was Jamaica, was anywhere, you know, and a brother was, uh, you know, a son, right? And so I started to think about the interchangeability and the interconnectedness. And that was really, I mean, it's a form of vision. I suppose you can move forward from it, but it really was seeing how things were all woven together. Nice. Cyrus, what's your take on that? Um, 
I am very, very rarely, rarely an occasional poet. I always create in cycles and sequences, mm. and this book was no different. I've only, I don't think I've ever created more than like a dozen occasional poems. One that I did, I wrote on my birthday in Promise Ten, and, and some friends made it into a film, a lovely film, but I always seem to be ambitious somehow and, and write things in cycles. So that's, that's the case, this is the case here. I originally had, I wanted to do like 25 or something that sounded grand, but I, I did more than 12 and then by 13, 14, 15, I, was, I just wasn't really happy with them. Um, the chapbook is actually part of the horse ranch book. And I decided to separate it out because the rest of the book is so homoerotic. I wanted to give the, the, the Benedictine brothers a gift. So I separated it out. That's the story of the chapbook book because it's really part of the horse ranch book. So when people talk about how many books I have, it's like really, you know, it's really part of quote the eighth book. But I just wanted to give it to them as a gift, which I have. And, you know, people love it on its own. So, I mean, the horse, their horses, as you can tell, if you, in the, the last uh, three or four poems in the book, I lived next to a corral. So, and their horses throughout the whole book, even the sexy, funny poems. There. Just a quick question about the structure then. Um, I was so struck by the 12. I had no way of knowing that you had paired it back from a larger number but it seemed very fitting, like a book of hours, book of days, you know, very much <laughs> notion it's, of the religious. Yeah, it's great, it's hindsight, you know. I yeah. thought I needed to have something grand like 22 or 20 or like the Tarot deck or 21. But I just felt like part of being there is learning to, to be in silence and be in the con contemplation. And I think somehow the real the need for silence got more deeply into the sequence. You know, I wanted to write a little bit more about the community of the brothers and the people who would come in from the outside. And the only way I could do that was in the Feralitos poem, which I'll read shortly. But I, the sense of the community there, it's the largest monastery in the country in terms of monks. There's about 70 uh, oh, religious like people there. And you haven't said that it's in New Mexico. <clears throat> I don't think you said that yet. It's in Abiquiu, New Mexico, across from um, where George O'Keefe lived in Ghost Ranch. Right. It's 12 miles of unpaved road to get to the monastery. <laughs> it's a great That's trip. That's a very, very um, interesting example of two absolutely different ways of configuring your books. Um, but you, even if you didn't plan everything, once you assemble and you see there's in hindsight, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, of course. Would you agree with that, Christina? Yeah, absolutely. And some things don't fit. I mean, it's always hard when you're putting a collection together a little more piecemeal than what Cyrus is doing. Uh, maybe you're adding new poems and taking poems out. And when is the mix just right? But I think you start to kind of intuit the, the mood of what you're trying to do and the facets. And then you know when enough has been said enough has been said i would really like to just turn this over to cyrus to read a first set of poems from the new book all right you um with you <laughs> there's a tiny bit of latin in the first poem um i was given two different hermitages and the first one was called the 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 peace of saint francis hermitage and the poem is called accepting the peace of saint francis hermitage Listen, out of love and goodwill, I was given a hermitage. From the prior's hand, a choir stall of layered terracotta cliffs to contemplate, to venerate. Benedictus qui venit in nomine domini. Benedictus qui venit. A cusp of inchoate vermilion and liberating blue, an umber ribbon length, imagine, of rustic unpaved road, ushering my winterproof boots, past grazing ruminants and the lissom rivers, glitter and meander. Dear beneficent prior, will I find impartial God in the time-worn mountains that cradle Cassiopeia and Cygnus, the great swan? Will I learn to embrace the wind-blessed peace and serenity of St. Francis? 
and the breeze plied December Abbey under the dipper seeker. Each midnight now I'm seized by the Imperial Milky Way, the mainstay seven sisters, ruby rare ornaments gleaming in the brisk black cauldron of the midnight river's buffeted mirror. The next poem is called Lighting Ferrolitos on a Windy Christmas Eve. I'm not sure people know what ferrolitos are. They're, they're actually bags of sand with candles in them and, you, and they put up on the rooftops and sort of kind of on the eaves there. But we were trying to do it on a windy day. It was not easy. Lighting ferrolitos on a windy Christmas Eve. On a pell-mell Christmas Eve, whistling, planning, Brother Dorian has crafted a poignant creche from malleable mud and cutaway timber. Though a Hector and Canyon wind defies us, bedevils us, after a dogged wintry dusk, the desert abbey is adorned at last by lucid rows of southwestern ferrolitos, italicizing the exacting yet utterly elating task of our chilly sundown handiwork. We intent seekers who represent the Earth's diverse stations, Malawi, Quebec, Poland, Vietnam, questing strangers, Yuletide pilgrims who've assembled, Mabel, who's battling liver cancer, Victor Emmanuel, who's sponsoring a school in Lima for eager children to bloom into sterling thinkers and prescient leaders, Cameron, who has veered far from home since his querulous wife revealed she's pregnant by his closest friend. City-dwelling dreamer, desperate as a foraging Joseph, seeking an eligible inn and finding only a dismaying manger. Now almost hallowing snowflakes settle on still irate Cam's dynamic shoulders like delicate epaulets. May he May each of us embrace suffusing peace or enduring truce in this desert canyon at Christmas. And another one, Messengers of the Desert Air, is the last one in this set I'll read. Um, if in the enveloping morning, new disciple, in the Messiah's desert garden, I sing, Kestrel's caw, golden eagle's ark, hawks reconnoiter, Remember here in this arid valley, the myriad raptors, agile ravens, and go for broke jays can, in a match stroke, be revealed as daylight messengers. If I declare January's lamp black banner, a flag of rallying crows, it might mean the traveling Benedictine with his indispensable staff, his windswept sleeves billowing black as a king's cortege, all at once halting on the uphill road to salute you, noontime apostle, avid and long blessed, so full of stamina, you who have idolized the sibling birds, the spinning earth's pine green allure, but have been in your marrow bones a benighted foreigner to reverential stillness and pressing altering silence, a stranger deaf as Beethoven at the close to unutterable beauty. That's my first set. <laughs> Beautiful. Let's just, without stopping, go straight to Christina so people can really get a sense of how different your voices are. Well, and I just realized I have some unstoppable beauty in this poem, that, which is almost exactly what you said, Cyrus. So, um, yay for unstoppable there a, beauty. <laughs> there's, and there's a church at the center of some of my poems, but it's not a place of, of peace like yours. It's a place of sort of punishment. So, okay. um, this poem is it's an Icelandic name of a town, and it's called Kirkjubaija Kloster. Um, here it goes. This is how you break the children. This is how you sever the husband with ice and flame. Take them to the land of unspeakable names and beauty unstoppable and drop them. 
in a white one-story hotel where you just enjoyed a most refined meal. Farm-raised Arctic char, boiled potatoes, peeled and shaped into elegant oblong eggs, a stitch of dill. The lobby chandelier is modern glass and the floors blonde ash and you drop them on the heads of nothing. They dangle in the hallway and they look at you in disbelief and they dangle. Next day, you buy a book from 1783 about nine months of devastation, sulfur, ash, and swollen sheep here in this small town where the earth ripped in two, where you left them. Um, and Magda, you asked about She Giant. That's the name of this poem, although it may not illuminate much, She Giant. I am the next big one to blow. My body over these seething fields, no joke. I bear char marks, black feather scars. The weight of myth. The brass on their fingers audacious. We walked on boiled mud. The earth opened around my husband's sandal. There was a wound in the earth and he stepped right into it. Welcome to the land of here we go again. At the end of the first saga, a she giant falls through grass to the bottom of everything. There you will find a sour yellow sea. All over the past we walk without even thinking, step on everything without knowing. And then I'll read uh, one more in this set. Um, I mentioned there are some Greek gods. There are some Norse gods that show up and there are some Greek gods. And in this poem, um, there's a minor goddess. Her name is Sophrosyne. She's the goddess of moderation. Uh, and I'm gonna blame her for what I, blaming the gods for what I did and didn't do. Um, Ode to restraint in a West Village bar or other gods I have invoked. Lord, I knew that man was taken, but hey, the apple teeny bit my heel and I was hard with hunger, coiled on a red leatherette bar stool west of Eden. Oh, praise his teeth, bright as a life raft, praise his golden throat. How could I have known that arrows dressed me that morning, handpicked the black lace bra? Did someone say wife? Damn, Sophrosyne, muse of duller heads, I was home free till you showed up keeping my rosy fingers off his wine dark jeans, the meat of his knee. Can't you see I'm owed? Slither me up the white calf of Atlas to burn that bright scapula blade blue. I would rip the sky to fill my mouth. There you go. There's the giant speaking, Magda. <laughs> I want to know more about that giant. So um, I hope you'll elaborate a bit in this next uh, the dialogue. Um, you know, both of you, the, your landscapes are so different, and your book is suffused with a sense of, I say sense because it goes from country to country and myth to myth, but a sense of Scandinavian backstory, background, back soil, I think is a word that you like to use a lot. And Cyrus's work is very much coming out of south at least i feel that you can you know elaborate or or disagree cyrus but i know you as a someone who has combed the mediterranean who also has a book set in gala and is gravitating all the time south it seems anyway he says he's based in austin texas um no i grew up in <clears throat> southern california that's where i grew oh, there up you go. that's where you go. boy Mediterranean climate. That's why I like the Mediterranean, right? But the question that I want to ask you, um, it sort of overlaps language and place. You, it seems to me that is really important for both of you. Uh, you've even said as much, each of you. But I wonder if you would like to say something about that, because I think it's always really interesting to people. And at the same time, um, something about language, what you try for in your own lines, which are so, so different. Again, it's just like sometimes with poetry, 
the voice is as unique as a fingerprint. And I do feel that with each of you that, you know, Cyrus is a word coiner, always the line is long, the line is lush. It may be a cliche to say that, but I do feel it's true. Christine, impressing, economical, sometimes elliptical, and sometimes enigmatic. Uh, we don't always know in reading your work, Christina, who the characters are, because as you just said moments ago, a sister can be uh, a mother, and a mother and a sister can be some kind of a god, a presence. You use the word saga in your poems too. And so there's that sort of runic sense, forgive me. I mean, it might be stereotypical, but I do feel that you're on some level claiming time and place in an almost mythical way. In well, yeah, and I, and I think what I'm trying to do is almost, you know, like divination, reading the bones, reading the tea leaves, right? And so the emotional terrain to me, and, and we had talked about this earlier, is uh, there's very, there's a lot of splintering that's happening, right? And there's like a breaking away from a sense of wholeness. And then there's being out there sort of dissolving and not knowing where the pieces fit. And I think, um, you know, the landscape, again, like I said, in Iceland, the landscape is very much, it's volcanic, right? And it's craggy and sort of new life springs out of old. Um, but I was thinking about this with Cyrus's poems, set in the desert. To me, a desert is a very foreboding kind of dry place, right? And in Cyrus's work, it's abundant. And so I think in some ways, you bring the mood state to the place that you're writing into. I don't know, Cyrus, if you, how you feel about that with the desert. Well, it's interesting because I actually grew up in a much starker desert. I grew up in the, the high desert of the Mojave which is about as bleak as you can get because my father was uh, based in Edwards Air Force Base. So all I saw as a kid were Joshua trees and, and dry lake beds. So when I finally, I remember my family driving through Arizona and Mexico City, it was just like this magically beautiful red rock kind of desert. So I'm actually a desert person. So I, you know, I feel comfortable in it. But the red rock around the, the monastery and Abiquiu and where Georgia keep lived is just spectacular. There's a whole layer of saffron yellow rock. It's a color I've never seen anywhere else on the planet. So that is a special kind of uh, abundance there to me. I mean, the, it's also beside the Chama River, which I describe at points, you know, in the poems here. So it was, and I was there at different seasons too, not just just one, right? So. Yeah, there was a sense of abundance. I was there in spring, the second time in May, and it was completely different. It was very green around there. And of course, mm -hmm. the horses were out, and it was just a different kind of experience there. But yeah, I fought against the desert as a kid because I I was originally born in Delaware, and then what my earliest memories of Seattle, it was like the opposite of where I grew up, Seattle. My grandmother, my father's mother was from Seattle. So my earliest memories are super green. And then we moved to the the Mojave Disney, it was like an exile, you know? Right. <laughs> Drawn to certain places or do you happen to be in a place and then you write into it? Either one of you. Hmm. You wanna start with that one, Cyrus? <laughs> well, I'm just thinking that every <laughs> place is like a, a, a stage, a theater, right? <laughs> and you're trying to figure out you know, what are the elements of the theater? I mean, if you're paying attention, and I teach a landscape workshop called the Landscape Things in Me, are you paying attention to the colors of the place? What kind of people show up in the place? What kind of sounds, what kind of animals? In other words, each place has a spirit, right? Is, has, has a kind of soul, which is my what my friend Linda Lappin talks about. Now, the, what's the soul of the place? And I think as poets, we tend to somewhat organically try and connect with the soul of the place. I think that's exactly right. And, you know, sorry. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. I didn't know you were gonna say something. No, sorry. Um, I was thinking about what we were talking about with vision versus sight, right? And sight is really mechanical and anatomical and, you know, you see what's there. But vision is like Cyrus said, seeing the soul of something. 
And so very often, like when I first went to Mexico to this town, it actually jarred me because it's so, it has mm. so much presence, right? And so I think it's vision is also being intuitive and feeling the sense of place in your being, right? And not just relying on your eyes that can lead you in the wrong direction. Bien. Why don't we try to um, listen for that as Cyrus reads into his second set of poems. And reading each other's work, uh, Christina has a poem called Then. And I remember that in translating Frances Parcerisa's work, the great Catalan poet, he has a super powerful poem called Then. And he was thinking about the Serbo-Croatian war. It's very short, but it's very intense. So, so this is an intense set from the, from the sequence. Uh, then, then with her hands, she crowned her son's head. Then with her arms, she'd embrace him. Then with her fingers, she'd pluck out his eyes. Then with her teeth, she'd gnaw his liver. Then with motherly claws, she'd shred his memories. Then with her nipples, she'd nourish him on the milk of hatred. Then with her tongue, she'd insist, Lord, Lord, I'm only doing this for love because you pledged that this bread is your body and this wine your blood. I'm gonna read a poem after this that's in my sequence called Mary's Day. And it's dedicated to my colleague, Kathleen Pierce. We were having, um, we were having a thesis panel and it was Good Friday. And she said, you know, Good Friday is also Mary's day. I thought, wow, what a profound idea. So I wrote this poem for her, Mary's day. Wait, this hour of circling kestrels and callous sentries dice, this rain undoing Friday of unremitting nails, clarified by mordant daylight and searing torchlight. Hear me out, is also Mary's day. Mary the mourner, the peerless maker, the harrowed witness to her son's desecrated body, human majesty that can never be recovered, not by hyssop or unceasing prayer, Mary, the fearless, intent listener, forever bending to gauge the tenor of her small son's cough. Uh, one more from the sequence. It's called A Monk's Textbook of Shadows. Brother Lucian, in the roaring hush that seizes your austere cell, you imagine that you hear the busybody world's rampant demons. Well, I've got your demons, truth teller, God seeker. Listen, as a diligent pupil, you don't have to study break spirit lynching trees or the trail of tears, foot sores and fever blankets, swamps and insolvent treaties to quail at the long abominable spell of inglorious shadow at the brutish deputy in us, the lack love warrior who clamors for the spilled blood of others and heralds it as new pressed wine. So I'm gonna end this set with my newest poem about the pandemic. And it's such a huge overwhelming thing to even begin to address, but this poem poured out of me and it's just a one page poem. And um, you'll, you'll be familiar with the elements of it. But I gave it to Ron Slate, the editor, and he said, we're publishing this like three days from now. So it's maybe the fastest, I'm gonna say farm to table poem that I've ever done, but you'll recognize. And the, the title comes from a quote from Albert Camus 1947 novel, The Plague, where Dr. Yu says, it sounds like a ridiculous idea, but the only way to fight the plague is with decency. The only way to fight the plague is decent decency, an American elegy. 
Once upon a time, there was a hoax, a broadcast to the hilt ruse, a pure leader's adamant refusal to rally arms against a colossal viral dragon, a winter hustler's fiat that bloomed one titanic coffin heavy April into a real as your mother's dying hand pandemic. National Malay featuring stock selling senators, runaway test kits, mask begging nurses, and jerry built morgues. A storm haired Lear's placid sideshow, a charlatan's heedless snake oil matinee. Hail the flim flaming functionary and his red handed band of land where all the poisonous hierarchies arrived to poison us once more where raucous pettiness equaled roll calling brisk as business death equaled my crushed kingdom for a ventilator. Can you take it from there, Christina? Yes, I'm, I'm not sure how to follow that. I'm going to go from the wide scope to the small. And I realize in this next set of poems, there are a lot of objects. And sometimes with a very narrow lens, you know, the objects become displacements for the things that you are thinking about. Um, this is somewhat of a garden poem. So I don't know if anyone out there, whoever is out there, has actually planted daffodils, but they're somewhat arresting visually when you first look at the daffodil bulbs. So this poem is called The Widow Plants Daffodils. When you first tear open the brown paper sack and peer down, don't be alarmed at their nakedness, how they huddle in clutches of six or 12, some with brittle skins, others bald and all blank faced. Take them one by one, hold each in your palm the cream white meat of its flesh, neither heavy nor light, its body a teardrop with roots. Then choose a spade edged with teeth and cut a hole twice deep as they are tall. And among grubs and glass bits, make for them soft brown caves and line these with bone dust, then bury them. But you won't dream of their slender necks rising, the ruched cloth of them, all that perfume spilt from loose cups. No, when cold clamps down around the house, you will stiffen. Shovel the walk and take out the trash in the dark. Trudge under black bones of trees. Try to dislodge from your mind the difficult man who left in late August and your grown children gone. You'll forsake the humble onions that you entombed. But they of whom you have asked the impossible will not fail you. So stop now before you begin and take a moment to know their names. Salome, Ice Queen, Rip Van Winkle, Early Bride. Um, this next poem is a list, I guess you'd say a list poem, um, but sort of a list of obstacles that one has to Omens, obstacles, you know, charms, like the whole bag of tricks that sometimes is needed to move on. Um, how to get out of a 20 year hole. A prison spoon, sharp teeth, a rosary and chicken feet, a compass rose, magnetic blood, TNT, equanimity, and a diamond file for a finger. Jeweler's loop, rubber suit, passport stamp, kick in the ass the right shoes, the North Star, a shiv and an ampule of musk, sulfuric acid, a wooden mask, a litmus test, laughing gas, atom bomb, a doctor's note, the hammer of Thor, a metaphor, a stronger rope, a longer hope, a golden tongue, le mot juste, safer roost, divining rod, echolocation and a sleeve of magical staves. But in order to exit, I first had to step over the body. And then the last in this little set is the poem, Then. So uh, Cyrus read the translation that was so gorgeous of that then poem. And this then poem um, tries to think about what happens when something just dematerializes, right? Something important, just a person just disappears. And then what do you put in its stead? 
then. When you are gone for good from me, irrevocably gone, irretrievable. And when my body has done the brute work, gut and lungs, mouth and fingers, whose very nature is to take and to hold and to take. When this same body has put down its own heat and turned to feed elsewhere. When I'm sitting in my little yellow room and leaves slipping inside me and you vanished, what will become of you then? Will you be thin lace fronting the pain that I could see through, but that alters everything? Will you be sun dust risen from nowhere, insubstantial, dissolving in a shade that cannot enter me? Or will I burnish our story into myth, harden you to marble? Will I put you on a horse? That's that. You know, the more we, the more I feel, I, I really, uh, I'm relishing this immersion, re-immersion for me in your work. Um, you have such different ways of proceeding in sequencing and so much in, in Christina seems to be almost accreting, just laying words down and, and jamming them. And there's often a kind of very sly, interesting sense of irony verging on humor in poems that describe huge pain and rage. It's quite, quite unusual, I think. And Cyrus, I, um, I'm gonna turn this uh, over to you to start with a question that's really also now um, about language uh, because, well, language is the medium. Language is what we make the art in and out of. Um, I wanted to ask you about the way in which in your poems, as in Christina's, though, of course, really differently. Um, there's an undertow of loss and a sense of a kind of, maybe it's, it's pain, but it isn't sort of personal confessional sort of pain, almost an empathic connection to pain that's out there in the universe. And um, both of your poems reflect a kind of longing for deliverance from pain. We all long for that, I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to know um, if you feel, looking back now on, on your book, and I'll ask Christina essentially the same question, is there a consolation born out in the sequence of your 12 poems? Is there some lease? Is there some moment where it feels as if there is redemption. I mean, it's very, very colored by by a sense of Christian uh, belief, even if lightly worn. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there's, there's another interesting thing. There's certain words you make up. Mm -hmm. There's other words that you take, use, and reuse throughout. So I was very struck on, on my several readings of your book by variations of the word elation. You are elated and there is elation. And I think uh, it's rare to encounter that word. We have it within us, we do, but uh, it's not always uh, so easy to uh, to find or to contact. So. That's, that's a sort of rambling question, but it really is about the, the sort of dialogue between pain and loss on the one hand, and some kind of consolation that poetry might afford. Well, I have a fondness for the word elation, I confess. I have a fondness for words that aren't used so often to find it, to sort of resurrect the particular word there. Um, when I first, spent Christmas at the monastery, as I was describing, one of my closest friends had died in Paris, and I'd lost another friend, so I was going through uh, a lot of loss the, the preceding summer, and it was the first time that I could even begin to address my grief, so the grief is very much there. 
I was literally, for the first time in my life, with my friend close to the time he died. I was very much in his physical presence just before he died. And I seemed to be more aware that he was about to die than even he was. So mm. it was this opportunity going into that silence uh, to experience that. Uh, one of my oldest friends had died and I wasn't aware that he was ill. And, and then um, my assistant's father was killed in a stand your ground killing. So um, it was a lot to process and I was overseas in Europe when all these things happened. So when I landed back and it was in this landscape, it was like, oh, I can begin to address some of what my feelings are. And with one of my friend's death, it became a sort of medieval knight's tale. Uh, everything was told in a different setting and um, kind of ambiance, and it was a release for me, right? But I also think it was such an incredible gift. I'm not a Catholic, and yet I was invited into this monastery, and I was really there on the other side. I was working with some of the monks. I was reading poetry to them. I was tutoring them. I was really welcomed fully into the community and I, into rituals that people wouldn't normally see. Um, they're not, they're traditionally kind of considered a silent um, part of the church, but that's, at first I thought my friend couldn't speak at all after I'd seen him for years, I'd seen him for 10 years. I thought, well, is he gonna be able to talk to me? But you can put a sign up requesting silence, right? So the first poem I'm gonna read in the next set is about the sense of silence here, but it was, it was, I was grieving and it was also a gift. And it was also a new world, you know? Christine and I both grew up Episcopalian. My, my monk friends say, you know, Catholic light, L-I-T-E. But it was just, it was both things at once, right? And that's, that's what you're picking up, you know, that was what, two years ago, it was picking up in the, in the poems, you're very astute. Plus empathy is a huge part of my art and, and my, my way of being in the world, you know? It's not, you're right, it's not confessional. Someone came to me with my second book and said, you're not in your poems at all, what it, where, where are you? I'm like, well, I guess I'm not interested in everyday Cyrus for the most part. I don't seem to be interested in my art. So when I try to, to write directly from my everyday experiences in Beautiful Senor, it still didn't seem like to me, it seemed like a contrivance. They were really my experiences made into poetry, but it still felt like, like artifice to me. So, you know, that was, a, that was a paradox there. So I think that's plenty there in terms of the elegiac part. It's very real, very real. Can we hear from Christina on the same notion of, the, of, a, of a sense of longing and also that tension perhaps between pain and anguish and a search that maybe delivers in some way? I don't know, I don't want to put words in <laughs> Yeah, well, it's funny when I read Cyrus's work and it was so beautiful and I said to Magda, well, what we have here is the agony and the ecstasy, right? Because, <laughs> and you know, your lines are ecstatic in a secular and a religious way. And I guess, I don't know, honestly, where come from whence comfort cometh, if that's even an expression. Um, I look at it, uh, is, is someone keeping me company, right? Uh -huh. I can say these awful things and I guess you're still with me or, <laughs> you know, there is no resolution. There's just only getting used to, right? Like something is impossible and then one day it's not impossible and it's not really comfort. I guess it's just, can I put these things into words? And then once they're in words, I look at them and say, okay, well, they're in words, that's a start. <laughs> So it's a very much a seeking process, more than a finding process. So. Would you like to start? Sure. Okay. So I'm going to get up oh. and try to cast some light on my computer. Yeah, it looks a little dark. Um, so the next uh, two poems take, take place in, um, where the Battle of Antietam was, which is the largest uh, one day you know, casualty count in the Civil War. Um, this poem is called Missing. After leaving my brother in the mountains, we drove together back to separate homes, my ex-husband and I, past signs for caves, caves inside other caves, a chain of holes beneath us, this road we drove once a dark sea. We passed Antietam too, and because I like to hear him explain things, I ask what happened here. 
He knew I would forget, just like the Battle of Midway that he explained to me every single time I walked into his favorite movie. This man who bought me an expensive watch right after I lost an expensive watch. I see now how this was love. We left my brother, Christer, behind, which is also love, I tell myself. I don't feel so good, was the last thing Christer said. My ex is laying out Civil War tactics, and I'm thinking about the cows. On the drive down, whole battalions of cows scrubbing bare the hills, and now only fields of fog. They had to be somewhere. I waited for a black head to pierce the whiteness as confirmation, like a sudden musket flash. Waited. They lost all sense of reality, my ex went on, what with the spew of guns and horse guts and the roar of bodies torn. Couldn't tell enemy from brother. The cornfield was a vast altar, boys buried where they fell. I realized it had been dark for some time and we had stopped speaking. Still so far from our homes, this car a disappearing light. Someone turned on the radio and we listened to comedy the punchlines coming rapid fire, words caustic and crude, drove and drove for hours, are laughing relentless. And then I guess two other antitomy poems. They both have the same name, but they take a slightly different uh, approach. Antietam. Christer is a ghost. We left him in the mountains. Friends and doctors assured us of our rightness, so we left him. In a hollow amid red hills, a porch swing swings, empty, and Christer is sitting on it. Sitting on it a ghost, we left mountains, friends, and us of our. We left him in amid red hills, swings, empty, and sitting on it. Christer is him in the doctor's rightness. So a hollow, a porch swing, Christer is. And Tetum too, where dirt cuts red and fresh gashes redder still. This is where we drink from, say the trees that I pass. This is how we shade black cows. And the last poem I will read um, is sort of a landscape, but a landscape of the face. I guess it's sort of a transformation. Well, I'll just read the poem. It's called After the Fire. Goodbye to the maps that we'd fallen in love with, the habitual hills. Yes, of course there was pain, the constellation we're born under. Isn't our remaking always violent? But look, now the burnt tufts of hair are virgin forest. A mountain range has bloomed from my temple to my jaw, ropey and smooth, and now a river like a root shoots down your neck into the royal valley of your clavicle. A new continent broken from my back, pink and pricked with stars. Thanks. Thank you, Christina. Cyrus, we turn to you for a last sequence. I'm just gonna read two of the poems. Uh, silence again. This one's called Monastic Silence. Mm -hmm. Listen to the unstoppable Chama River's roaring missive, the arresting hawk's cry, the clanging bell at starry vigils, then seer demanding ghost town in the wild west silence, deep as a dilapidated well, door closing silence, the vast scapular, the sable cloak of night, clapperless silence, monks paramour, souls rosary, saints reliable stratagem. Here comes the rallying cry of the wild spinning weather vane, then the canyon storms alarum, quick Herodin harsh rain claiming a deep carved arroyo, then sheriff fierce, swift-footed silence, the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil denouement, the red desert deus ex machina, the tight-lipped auto de fe, silence, immense silence, surpassing all human design, bellowing silence. 
And then the final poem I'm going to read is the last poem in the sequence and the title poem of the sequence. It's from Psalm, I guess it's Psalm 129 in the Catholic Psalm book, but 130 in the Protestant one. Uh, More than watchmen at daybreak, my soul is longing for the Lord. More than watchmen at daybreak. The river's soft pistons, the river's black silk, undershooting stars, the viable ink and silver white sky looming above the stark monastery becomes the coppice elk's vast eternity. The duena moon, all at once coquettish, brash as sin, blanches the river curve, the heron, the corral of fast asleep horses. August, the soul says, yes, I was there. When raffish runaway flames claimed the orphanage, when rampant smoke drove the dying into the summer sea. Present when riled protesters cried, if they fire into the crowd, and then they fired into the crowd. When the aghast stranger fingering a galling dungeon photo asked, what kind of God would allow that? More than fleet querying owls, more than nightlong watchmen, born wide awake and dying. I confess, not even this wondrous colossus of shooting stars the extravagant earth's countless beauties seem capable of quenching this lust, this innermost hunger for return. Incensed and restive in this desert monastery, thirsty, fallible, but not yet resigned, full of questions and parrying, Lord Buddha, God of Abraham, from wolf's hour to blue hour, to burgeoning dawn. We've come almost to the end of this cycle of readings. I'm so, so grateful to both of you for coming or stepping out of, I guess, or opening the doors to your quarantine. It feels good. Reading. Yep. <laughs> it's good. It feels oh, natural. We could lose it. I felt like I was losing all of that pandemic stuff for a while, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I know. Like, yeah. oh, that's out there somewhere. Right. <laughs> it's an out of body experience. And uh, momentarily, I have to step out of my body to try to put the lights on here because the sun is setting in Mexico and there's no overhead lights here the way the buildings are built, but I'll see what I can do. Anyway, I, um, I wanted to check whether we actually have a, a pileup of questions. Uh, if we do, we'd be happy to open the floor briefly. Um, and I'll, I'll wait for, for news of that from our hidden genie behind the screen. So I'm getting instructions that I should use my cell phone. What a great idea. <laughs> Create light. I think we can hear uh, crickets in the background there. It's very atmospheric. Oh, yeah? That's funny. <laughs> I Sounds don't... like it anyway. Yeah, I don't hear any crickets, but, uh, well, this isn't working wonders. I see Gabriela Damian, who is the assistant director of Under the Volcano. And if Gabby has appeared, it's probably because we have some questions. Uh, am I right? Well, we don't have questions, but we do have comments and uh, the comments are so nice i just feel the urge to, to <laughs> transmit them to you so um laura hopes says this is a wonderful event thank you all um christopher baca says thank you all for this sublime reading mm -hmm. Lisa Jardin, I don't know if I'm uh, pronouncing it correctly, <laughs> but she says, I'll never think of daffodils the same way again. 
It's like Blue Velvet, the movie. Yeah. <laughs> I'll never think of Blue Velvet the same way again. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad, but you know. Yeah. It's different, right? It's different. <laughs> Laura Hobbs also says, I love the rawness and yet eloquence, transparent and confident. Um, and Carol Southall says, excellent pairing of poets. Norma Liliana Valdez says, hey, Norma. Cristina, Norma. you just reminded me what I love about your poems. Bravo. Oh, she's wonderful. I miss Norma. And uh, there are a lot of other comments now, but I, I'll leave you so you can continue because it's so delightful to hear you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Um, I wanted to say one more thing about the comments, which is uh, to remind people, they will appear on the Facebook feed when we upload the video of this event, which will be in the next day or two, or perhaps even before. I think perhaps it's automatic. But if we're going to sort of close down the house, I just have a couple of things I would like to say. Certainly want to thank, first and foremost, Christina Beecher and Cyrus Cassells for being here, doing this, uh, here being wherever. <laughs> we talked about the place. We now have to deal with no place and figure that one out. Uh, thanks to Gaki for staying there behind the scenes and reading out the comments. And huge thanks to our puppeteer in residence, Juan Arevalo, who makes this all flow so beautifully. It's really fantastic and a very new role for Juan, who is also the designer of our gorgeous website. So the other thing I wanted to remind you all about is that we're here to celebrate the publication of these two books, which both came out in plena pandemia, right in the middle of the pandemic, which means hard to get to bookstores, please, uh, if you've enjoyed the reading, go directly to their publishers. We'll be posting the link on this chat and it's also um, will be on our social media in the coming days. So I hope you will uh, extend yourselves and bring those books into your own uh, spaces. <laughs> I'm choosing my words so carefully now because a lot of our points of reference are kind of you know, the signposts have moved around, haven't they? Uh, I think that's really most of what I need to say. And other than that, to thank the audience, which is out there. Uh, we salute you and we're grateful for your attention, your interest. And we hope that you all stay very, very safe. Good night from Teposlan. <laughs> Good night, night thanks, from San Marta. Francisco. And from Stockbridge. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you guys. Gracias. Buenas noches. Buenas, Buenas noches. noches.